afternoon. My name is Michelle Bonner, and I am the Chief Counsel of Defender Legal Services at the National Legal Aid Defender Association. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the first of a three-part series of our um, BJA Right to Counsel Technical Assistance webinar series, Budget Advocacy in the 21st Century. Our first session is on cultivating relationships, and we have um, with us the two panelists that I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but first, I would like to give you just a little bit of background about this series. This series is based on answers from you, uh, members of the public defense community, um, in relation to the ABA 10 principles of a public defense delivery system. When you filled out a survey that was sent by American University, um, the Justice Program Office, we uh, asked you some questions about the 10 principles, whether your office adhered to some or all of those principles, and what areas where you thought you might need some assistance and information. And based on that survey, we learned from you that a lot of the issues that um, you desired more information about was on budgeting, budget advocacy, and how to um, advocate for increased resources for your offices. And from that, we developed this three-part webinar series. And we thought that starting with the conversation about cultivating relationships was a good one, because that's something that um, you, all of the offices can do, regardless of your, your legislative um, schedule or your budgeting schedule. And we thought that also was an important area to focus on in terms of gathering support outside of yourself for that budget advocacy. This particular session will focus on uh, the 10 principles, number one, in terms of independence, um, and also other um, parts of the 10 principles, including number eight, in terms of parity, um, in terms of parity of resources between defender and prosecutor offices. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to provide you with some information and some experiences from these offices that will help you in your strategizing um, with cultivating relationships and budget advocacy. Now, this project is a partnership with American University Justice Programs Office and the National Legal Aid Defender Association. Um, we are funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, who is funding the entire Right to Counsel um, Technical Assistance Project. Um, so if you have any questions about the Technical Assistance Project, or about the webinar series, please, um, at the end of the presentation, we'll provide more information about how you can reach out to us for more information. Budget advocacy, cultivating relationships. Um, the panelists today will address the questions that you see on your screen, um, and will also give some of their firsthand experiences about how they have developed relationships to improve their position with regards to budgeting advocacy. Um, they will answer those questions like, you know, with whom should you start cultivating relationships? And when should that cultivation start? And what are some of those strategies um, that they've used that have been successful? Um, and um, how have these relationships affected their offices? The two panelists who are joining us today are Kira Bradford Gray. She's the Chief Public Defender of the Montgomery County Public Defender Office in Pennsylvania. And Durham Button the Chief District Defender of Orleans Public Defender in New Orleans, Louisiana. They will each give a, a, a presentation on their experiences with regards to budgeting um, advocacy um, and with particular um, how those relationships have helped them in that arena. And then you will have an opportunity to ask questions of the presenters um, of their experiences and general questions on how to strategize to help your office as well. First, we would like to start with Pierre Bradford Gray, Chief Defender of the Montgomery County Public Defender Office. Here, I'm going to hand it over to you. Exactly. All right. Good afternoon. Um, my presentation is pretty much going to be about the nuts and bolts and the detailed approaches that I took in building relationships. When I first began as a chief public defender, I really didn't get the value behind building relationships with the community. I 
kind of just wanted to make sure that my in-house strategy was to make sure my lawyers had enough resources to do their jobs in accordance to the 10 principles. But I soon learned that arguing the Sixth Amendment says that we're supposed to be funded a certain way wasn't getting me too much traction. Because although Gideon came out and said that every, every uh, person who cannot afford one has the right to have a lawyer, it doesn't talk about the quality of service. So I had to educate the funders, educate the public, and educate my stakeholders on why it would be better to resource our office and how that would help all of us, um, all of us in the long run. So what I had to do first, um, and I'll just give you a little backdrop about Montgomery County. I am a uh, chief public defender in Pennsylvania, where Pennsylvania has no statewide resources. So every funding opportunity for indigent defense services are on your local government. They are the only funders uh, that we have up to this point, and we are working on statewide um, funding, but at this point we do not. So you understand that Montgomery County Public Defender is a suburb of Philadelphia. And because it's a suburb of Philadelphia, that's particularly important. Um, they don't have the inner city issues that Philadelphia, what they would say that Philadelphia has, so as a result, they were really pro-law enforcement, which is, which is understandable. There were suburbs, the suburbs, they prided themselves on great school districts and safety. So public defense constituency was not the most popular. And therefore, what would be the incentive for our funders to fund us the way I think we needed to be funded so that we can carry out our duties effectively, um, most effectively? Starting with that, I had to kind of get a little gauge of my stakeholders. So I didn't have much information about the Montgomery County Public Defender because when I looked on to the website, the only thing that it really showed me was that there was one in existence. So I knew for, for one that there wasn't a lot of community awareness about what we did. So I'm gonna skip past them. First thing I did was met with the key stakeholders in our, in our area. And that was the judges, probation, the sheriff, and the district attorney. And my main reason for meeting with them, of course, was to introduce myself, but also to get a gauge of what was important to them. I needed to understand from their perspective what they thought, and even if I disagreed, what they thought the Montgomery County Public Defender Office did well, where they thought our strengths and weaknesses were, and uh, what was important to them, and where we can share some common objectives and goals. I quickly learned through listening to them that the judges, of course, were concerned about efficiency. Probation was concerned about getting reducing some of their caseloads. Uh, and of course, we could help with that with trying to resolve recidivism or reduce recidivism. The sheriffs were worried about transportation issues. That is something also the public defender's office could help out with because if we were able to uh, prep our case or have time to meet with our clients a certain way, we reduce the number of unnecessary transports. Um, and the district attorney, of course, she was worried about her, you know, her stats. She was a politician and her, her platform was that she had a 99% conviction rate. Now, that was something that we were totally gonna to disagree on, but there were a lot of things that we could agree on. Either way, I took notes, I kept it in, my, I kept it in a, a good um, area so that I can keep that on the back burner. So when I took inventory of my office, I can understand where I should start. After I met with the key stakeholders, the next thing I wanted to do was analyze what was going on in my own internal, in my own office. So, and this is, and I, I should say, this is prior to me taking the position. I had, this is when I accepted the position, but prior to me starting. Um, I interviewed all my staff, every single last person there to gauge kind of their level of advocacy, what their training was, um, what their expertise was, what had they tried. I had, I had to make sure I understood from their point of view what the system, how the system was designed to kind of stop them or block them from doing what they considered to be an effective job. And then I had to understand who was adversely affected by our inability to do our job in the way that uh, we thought was best. Um, and doing that, I also sent out anonymous questionnaires about issues with related to the office that they might not be as forthcoming to share, but they, all, they, they, they may want to give me a little bit more insight um, through an anonymous questionnaire. So I did all that information gathering, and then it was time for me to finally take my position. Now, I was very fortunate that in taking my position, um, 
I, there was a lot of media attention about the new chief public defender. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to get, uh, to make, be able to make a public statement. Now, this would be my first opportunity to let the public know who really didn't understand what we did. We had no value uh, for the most part to the community other than the people who came into our office and even some of them uh, weren't really bought into the fact that we delivered great services. Um, so I kind of had to center my first message around a very popular theme that could get grab the attention of the community, but also make sure that my stakeholders uh, were not alienized, alienated. I apologize for that. So if I can go back. This is my first public statement. And as you can see, I really carefully crafted it to, de to deal with the issue of children. And everyone, while they may not agree with what we do, um, and they think that we kind of do more to free the bad guys or find loopholes in the system, everyone can center their hearts around children and what happens to children in the system. So my first statement definitely dealt with children, and I tied into the fact that with the proper resources, we could do the most, we can do a better effective job for children. I also discussed wrongful convictions um, as it related to an issue of public safety, but also as related to the issue of lack of resources for the public defender. So my, my message and my mission statement was carefully crafted. And what I did slowly realize was that the media um, played an integral role in my introduction to the public, and that got a lot of, it piqued a lot of awareness. And I wanted to keep that type of um, relationship going. So I continued to make it to keep a relationship going with our press and, and our courthouse. I would write them um, follow-up letters about what we were doing. Every article or every uh, piece of uh, publication that I wrote them didn't make it. But however, some things did actually get in there when they were right for that issue. And we'll discuss that a little bit later when I show you some more of the slides on how, to gain, how I gained more traction with the media and, and, and using press releases to help build a, a constituent base. But next, I needed to get my message out to the public because in order to do that, in order to make, build relationships, I had to build a central theme that the public understood our value to them. And I wanted to make sure that we under, we, they knew that we were not just here to represent bad guys and free the bad guys, but we were also community problem solvers. And if they helped us help them, it would be a tremendous value to us all. So how did I make us community problem solvers? That was kind of a difficult task because I had to figure out which each segment of the community wanted to do or was concerned with. So I really worked hard and I got out to every uh, public uh, engagement that I was invited to. I gave a message about what I wanted to do. I, was, I went to every church uh, and listened to some of their issues. I talked to um, some of the, some of the uh, elected officials in the county, uh, and I'm talking about the council members, and I'm just, just kind of gauging what their priorities were. After I did that, I researched some of our social justice organizations. And I did that because I was always abreast on the hot button items, what was coming, what was down the pipeline. So I knew that the ACLU uh, in Pennsylvania, what the main thing that they were, they were doing at that time, and this was back in 2012, was researching or looking at the school to prison pipeline issue. They were really concerned that Pennsylvania was sending more kids uh, to our juvenile justice center from school for school disciplinary issues than ever before in record numbers. So I looked at that issue. I also looked at the NAACP because I understood that mass incarceration was something that, that was a heavy item on their criminal justice um, related, uh, I guess, issue. And so I knew that mass incarceration and recidivism was definitely something that was in our realm of expertise as well. And when I was talking about Dealing with children, I definitely knew that most of our children needed some kind of mentor. But what kind of mentor? I know that one, when I had um, discussed mentorship with churches, uh, some of them bought in, some of them didn't. Some of them really didn't understand our children, and of course it made them a little nervous to work with them because you talk about juvenile justice use, they're going to think the worst of the worst. But I, looked at, I saw an ad for Big Brother Big Sister one day, 
and they were talking about how they wanted to go into dealing with more kids that had uh, more of a problem background where they were dealing with kids that had one parent incarcerated, not necessarily kids who were actually incarcerated themselves, but had similar issues that our kids had. But even in, even in talking with them and setting up some of our meetings, I had to collect data. I had to get them to understand our personalized stories and how we could team up to share each other's mission. So when I contacted the ACLU, I wanted to understand what they were reviewing. I also contacted NAACP and Big Brother Big Sister, like I said, to discuss some of the um, first time youthful offenders that were being sent to uh, placement. And it wasn't enough for me to just talk about it, but I had to really show them vignettes of kids and give them an idea of what we were dealing with. So we collected data on those central issues. We focused our data collection on those issues. We looked at, in our office, and we have a pool of resources, of course, because we deal with thousands of cases a year. So we have a good database to, to research. We wanted to see how many school case uh, cases that we got in the public defender office alone, because some school cases didn't come to our office some cases would get diverted, but we also we just wanted to see how many cases made it to the juvenile justice uh, courthouse, which would be the court of common pleas in our area. And we, we, we came up with that breakdown. We also just kind of came up with some, just a, 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 you know, percentage of cases that we got, just kind of show the uh, ACLU what we were dealing with in our own area. In talking with Big Brother, Big Sister, I got the understanding that they were kind of concerned about their brand. I really wanted to engage Big Brother Big Sister because they were a national model. And what better relationship to have than someone who has a very national brand and very reputable and is very reputable across the country. So they needed to understand what we were dealing with. But I started to um, gather information about our kids to show them that these weren't dangerous kids. And for the most part, we were dealing with kids they were committing what, what we would call status offenses. And as you can see on this next slide, we dealt with charge breakdown. And we had, for the most part, our assault, and our assault deal with school fights. You know, fist fights, misdemeanor uh, assess, misdemeanor, I'm sorry, assault. We dealt with drugs, and that was our possession, misdemeanor possession drugs with marijuana. But we had, you know, thefts were high on our list. These are cases or things that you know, big brother, big sister can relate to and say, okay, as a youth, minors do engage in these types of behaviors, so we're not really dealing with a lot of the population that we would normally be afraid to deal with. We're not really dealing with some of your hardcore type of kids who are committing more of your public safety type of related, um, related crime. So that was how I opened the door to the conversation on how we can start to build a relationship with the ACLU and Big Brother Big Sister. Next, what I did was that once we started to get a relationship with Big Brother Big Sister, I knew I wanted to engage my stakeholders. And in this picture, this is very telling, this picture right here, and I don't know if you can see the uh, arrow, this is our district attorney. This is our county commission, he's a Democrat. This is our other county commissioner who is a Republican. And this is a representative from Big Brother Big Sister. And I and can't really see this woman right here, but she's a, a one of our, um, our vice chair of our county commission. These are our funders. My, the district attorney has a great relationship with our funders. This, former, uh, this funder right here is a former district attorney, and therefore he understood building these relationships and building the capacity to show the community that we are working together for a better result was something that's very important. So what I did was I reached out to my media folks, and we staged a press release around the theme of helping children who commit minor offenses get back on track through positive mentorship. And it really took off. It was a real um, nice way to message that we were here to solve problems, that we were gonna work with the stakeholders and work with members of the community to do so. We needed to draw members of the community to this. Um, to this. Can you see my arrows now? We needed to draw members of the community to this uh, event because we definitely needed them to be volunteers. So we needed to understand why was it important for you 
why it was important for them to get involved. Also, in all, in all the other relationship building types of um, ventures, we help community events with our local YWCAs, with some of our um, colleges and universities, and we did it centered around the, the um, issue of expungement. Now, expungement was another issue that was heavy down the pipeline. Expungement le legislation is uh, pretty, um, pretty huge in, in Pennsylvania right now. We are trying to expand expungement. I think it's actually uh, well talked about across the nation, how we need to give people second chances and give people more opportunities to find meaningful and gainful employment so that we can stop and we can reduce um, their likelihood of committing the same types of offenses. So we, we got our, our office got out to the community and we held free expungement clinics. We utilized, we advertised it very well. We utilized our media. We did our press releases on it. And we uh, invited other lawyers from the area. I don't know if you can see my arrow. I just got to, can you see it? Okay. Well, there's a guy with a hat on. <laughs> that He was a former DA that was now um, turned private defense attorney. And he was a part of our um, collaboration in doing this in some of his area and garnering support uh, with some of his other, um, yes, there we go. Thank you, Kim garnering support with some of his uh, constituents to come out and help. So we had a lot of former DAs come out there and do expungement. What great press release that was. And I know it sounds a little politician-y to keep talking about press release, but it really does make a difference. You cannot get reach the masses by yourself and to get the right messaging and to show collaboration and to show that you are, once again, a community problem solver um, is something that everyone would want to get behind and shows and also raises your value and visibility within the community. Last again, we kept on our theme around the area of expungement. And we gave we wanted to do introduce vignettes to the public about our youth who were being held back based on things that they did as a in, in their early teens. So we did a story about a, a young woman at the age of 14 who uh, had a theft. And um, she had a really, really good story behind her. She was raising uh, her four siblings. Her mother was sick with uh, terminal cancer. And she was really kind of left in a lot of binds as to how she was going to help the family with uh, finances. So she committed a theft um, and at the age of 19, at the age of 19, she wanted to go to um, nursing school. Well, she was denied the ability to go to nursing school because of her theft as a juvenile. So we kind of centered her story, put it out there, and then, of course, once again, we were able to get our theme out that we are here to, to, um, to help the public and be community problem solvers. Um, lastly, we, once we started to get buy-in by the community, we wanted to hand select the community so that they can be now be a part of what we deal with and help us garner more resources, help us be um, their uh, community lawyers. And we, we're having what we call a chief stakeholder roundtable to discuss the issues around criminal justice as kind of a civil rights movement. So I, that, that's pretty much what we did to garner support and what I did step by step. Um, there was a lot of you know missed attempts. But, you know, by getting out to the masses, you do find some people that you can actually work with right now. And then there's some people that you keep on the back burner. I'll turn it over. Um, first, before we turn it over here, I do have one question for sure. you, which is um, when you're going out and you're doing this outreach, did you find it um, challenging or did you find that you had to do a lot of basic education about what it is that you do and what your office does? Um, or do, were people aware of basically what a public defender office does? Were there some misconceptions, or how did you right. deal with that? There were a lot of misconceptions, and I did do some basic education. You just really can't do it all. When I met with people, I wanted to be centered around a particular theme, so I would talk to them about youth and what we were seeing and how they can help us. Uh, I would talk to them. I kept it about the youth for, to begin with, and then we started to branch out into other areas. So I'm still finding that we're still educating the public on what we do. It's not an easy education. It has to come 
from what I, my experience, to have to come piecemeal. And this community roundtable we're organizing is going to talk about the process of the criminal justice system and, and, and PA and how they can understand where their involvement will be necessary to help their loved ones or the community members get better results. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, of course, Kira will still be here to answer questions uh, from the group. And I also um, would encourage you to type in some questions. And if we see them on the screen, if we have time, we'll certainly try to answer them. We can also collect these questions uh, for the uh, presenters and they can also answer these questions um, after the uh, webinar ends. Um, we are going to Derwin Bunton, who is in Louisiana, and um, we have him here with us. Um, again, he is the, the uh, chief defender for the Orleans Public Defender's Office. Um, and I want to um, turn it over to Derwin so that he can um, give his presentation and then we can answer some, ask him some questions as well. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Michelle. Well, uh, what I wanted to focus on in my presentation, well, first, everything Kier said, do what Kier said, uh, because uh, it was essentially the same path that we, we came to when we started our office, and it is, it is imperative that you sort of get a, get a foothold in with stakeholders uh, in your communities, and all of these strategies and suggestions should go through an intensely local analysis. So keep that in mind. The other thing is my presentation is going to focus a lot on the outreach public education along with the mobilizing and organizing aspects that your offices might employ as you engage in your bigger budget advocacy. Uh, so with that, the, the first slide talks about outreach and public education. And for us, that meant going and doing a lot of the myth busting that the question alluded to just previously, uh, but also really going out and talking with people, building relationships. It is a campaign of conversations that you will have to enter into in order to be effective. And it's not just meeting for meeting safe. You are going to be building these relationships, hopefully to uh, leverage these relationships later. In, a, in, another, in another presentation, I made a joke. I did my best sort of godfather uh, imitation, uh, which is what we sort of go into these meetings with. We go in with an ask, you know, at some point I'm going to call upon you uh, to help me. So I'll I'll save you my very poor godfather imitation, but we'll tell you that when you go in, you should have a plan in mind for the relationships that you are building. And it requires a taking of inventory of your partners, allies, and adversaries, because you're uh, solidifying support, you're recruiting support, uh, but you're, you're also neutralizing opposition when you can, because you're not going to agree on everything, but sometimes, you can get uh, opposition to be quiet, which is sometimes the best thing you can do. And at bottom, it is constituency building, because when you go for budget advocacy, it is a lot of times easy to tell you no, but it is harder to say no if it looks like uh, decision makers have to say no to a lot of people in so uh, doing. All right. And I also want to talk about mobilizing and organizing. Once you get these outreach, once you do your outreach and you start, you start building these relationships, you want to get folks uh, to come together for you. Uh, so you, you want to motivate people and organizations uh, for a unified action. And in this particular instance, we're talking about budget advocacy, but it could be virtually any initiative in your office. And so uh, mobilizing is something I think public defender offices are able to do without a whole lot of changes and processes, without a whole lot of tweaking, as long as you did the relationship building up front. 
organizing is a lot harder and very few of us I don't have organizing capacity in my office I don't I don't employ any organizers in my office that's a lot harder that's bringing people and neighborhoods together for a united and consistent action on specific initiatives uh, and we don't do that we don't have the capacity for it so what we do is mobilize we find folks who have interests we find partners and allies with interests that are aligned and when we push an initiative we ask them to come join us for the press event for the budget hearing for uh, the letter writing campaign that sort of thing so we're asking for folks to join we are not organizing neighborhoods and groups of people for uh, any larger action and what I wanted to use to sort of frame how we use this is we have a current initiative running, our Louisiana Campaign for Equal Justice here in, uh, it's based in our office and it's running statewide and it's to reform how public defense is funded in Louisiana. And so right now, LCEJ is an example of how we're building constituency and leveraging relationships uh, and mobilizing support for change. We have a campaign manager that we were able to secure a grant for, and he travels throughout the state uh, engaging in, again, the campaign of conversations. And outreach is, it looks a lot like hunting uh, on a weekend with uh, decision makers you're trying to recruit uh, to support your initiatives. It looks like spending a few days in Lake Charles, Louisiana with McNeese State solidifying how they're going to go through the workforce study that is going to be presented, that is going to persuade the business community that public defense is something they need to be paying attention to and supporting. That's outreach. He goes up and down the state, side to side in the state, touching, um, touching decision makers, stakeholders, uh, and, and having these conversations, building these relationships. And before even that happens, we take stock. Be honest about uh, your problem and your organizational capacity. We're talking about budget advocacy. Again, this is intensely local, um, and it's a lot of work for a small problem. So if you're if if you don't have that big of a budget problem, I don't. First of all, email me so I can put in an application, uh, so I can find something else to do. But if you don't have a, a fairly large problem, then this is a lot of work for, uh, something, for something small. But if you really need to change your landscape, if you really need to change your outlook, your orientation, much like Kier and I uh, have had to do, then yes, you need to start taking stock, being honest about your problem and your capacity. Uh, and you need to brainstorm with some folks you trust what your capacity is, what you can sort of tolerate as an organization, and what you need to add to become effective. Right. You also need to inventory and assess the, the forces at play. So there's, there's a nuts and bolts to this uh, that is both internal and external. What do you want? Uh, who can give you what you want, who can take away what you want, what do you bring to the table, and who is already with you. Uh, generally speaking, while public defenders often feel alone, it is very seldom we are actually alone. But it is also very seldom that we tap into the support we do have. And so you want to be able to look at the forces at play. And this is what it looks like for LCEJ. We want to abolish Louisiana's user pay system. Uh, we want stable, reliable, and adequate funding for public defense consistent with the 10 principles. Uh, we need a legislative fix uh, from state and local authorities. That's who can give us what we want. And by the way, those are the same people who can take it away. Um, and what do we bring to the table? We have a lot of institutional authority. Uh, we have a new Public Defender Act that was passed in 2007 that gives us a lot of discretion in how we allocate our public defender resources. 
And who is with you? Right now, we have a lot of folks who support us here locally. Uh, but as we, but that we've come to that point through a process. And so you'll have to be honest in your own offices, in your own day-to-day, -day, who is with you. Sometimes it's unlikely folks. In, in a lot of jurisdictions, for example, you can have good sheriffs or good police. Uh, in some places, you may even have good DAs. Uh, you may have uh, the business community, chambers of commerce. We're doing a workforce study with McNeese State, uh, and it's because the business community wants to bring more business to Louisiana, but there is a problem with the labor pool, and a lot of that labor pool for uh, sort of low but skilled labor is out of the market because of prior convictions. And so it's very hard for a lot of folks who know how to do carpentry or welding or some of the other trades to be, to be certified, get their licensure because they have prior convictions. And so you need, that, you need a goal and outcome for, for all of your strategies. So for outreach and public education, here's what we put up for um, LCEJ. Very simple, not, not a whole lot. Now, of course, there's an, there's an entire back end of work to this, but you want to make a very simple sort of statement about your activities and what you want to come out of it. And we want a positive increase in awareness and support of public defense, and we want to educate people about the role of public defense and the Sixth Amendment. And we've been doing that by and large uh, through, our, through our campaign efforts. And uh, it was talked about earlier about the public education. It is, it is hard to do. And like I said, it is a campaign of conversations. And you gotta enter into some pretty hostile environments sometimes. But you shouldn't assume they're all hostile. Uh, if there's anyone out there who views uh, Duck Dynasty, for example, one of the presentations one of the speaking engagements that was done by our campaign manager had one of the family members from Duck Dynasty in the audience. And when he heard that Louisiana spends uh, more than $3 billion on criminal justice uh, every year, he stood up and was upset and walked out of the meeting. Um, and particularly, he was upset that most of it was spent arresting people and not defending people. And it was certainly uh, a reaction we could not have predicted. And you should, have a, you should have a goal and outcome for your mobilizing work as well. You want to have a mobilization plan to, to rally your allies and partners. Uh, you want to create coalition and constituency so you can make this happen. And one of the ways we do this um, in budget advocacy, what we've done in the past, as an example, is we have hearings uh, at the local level at our city council for budget. And we get our allies to show up and put in uh, their comment cards and talk about the positive engagement they've had with our office. And we've had a broad section of folks come and do that. We've had people from the New Orleans Business Council We've had uh, grassroots organizations, folks who represent a lot of our client community and our clients. And we've had uh, civic organizations, people that you would think would not care so much about public defense, who actually do care about public defense. And we pack the hearing. Those same folks also show up when you want to do an action or demonstration. Most recently, we did a, an action on the front steps of the courthouse where I made a call to our partners and allies to join me on the front steps where we would stand silent for four minutes, 25 seconds to represent um, the hours um, of the, the young man in Ferguson who lay dying or dead. And even to my surprise, there were about 250 people who showed up on the steps just because I asked them to. And we all stood there for four minutes and 25 seconds.
Now, I also want to talk to you a little bit about some of some of the obstacles in, in any kind of advocacy, but this is particularly true in budget advocacy and any sort of large-scale campaign. The biggest obstacles are going to be resources, processes, and values. Now, without, I don't think anybody, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that if you have a lot of resources, your chances of en engaging in increased advocacy go up. Uh, if you need a campaign manager, you hire one. If you need an organizer, you hire one. If you need a specialized unit, you create one. That, that's, that's in a world of just sort of abundant resources. Unfortunately, that is generally not our offices. Processes also can, can hinder things. One of the dilemmas as leaders is that processes are set up for a reason and they are hard to change. In fact, we make them hard to change. Uh, as leaders, we make them hard to change. There's, there's a vetting, there's, there's working groups, there's committees, there's all sorts of things when you're looking at changing processes. And they can hinder your ability to move quickly and be nimble when it comes to budget advocacy. And you have to look internally at your own processes, but you also externally have to learn the process. What is the budget process for your city council? What is the budget process for your legislature and your legislative session? Do you have a legislature like ours that has a full session one year and a fiscal session the next year, and they alternate? And then what does that mean? You have to educate yourself and educate the staff who are going to work on these, these budget advocacy uh, initiatives in your office so that you know the processes. But the big obstacles are going to be your internal processes and what you have to change to make sure you can engage in the advocacy. Now values probably even less flexible than processes and certainly less flexible than resources are values. Your organization, whether you like it or not, creates a culture for itself. Sometimes you can help mold it, you can help set the tone, and that's the best way to do it. But whether or not you do anything, there's going to be a culture and set of values by which your organization operates. And so, uh, for example, I've been criticized by, by judges, for example, for talking too much to the media. Why is he in the media? He's a public defender. And that's because they don't understand that that is something I'm supposed to do. However, our values are different, and it puts us in intention uh, a lot of the time. But also internally, there may be some questions about budget advocacy or any kind of advocacy you engage in that maybe what you want to do will seem out of whack with your values. I think here uh, in, in her slides, put up her, her first statement, which was basically the mission of her organization. If you don't have a mission and vision statement and or a purpose statement uh, and core values, you should really work to have those put together. So you uh, can capture and have a process to capture what those are so that you are acting consistent. And if you need to change them, it is very hard to do so. But if you need to change them to engage in better advocacy, then you need to know what they are and you need to change them because they operate whether you like them or not. Now, once you look at resources, processes, and values, and you've, you've navigated that successfully, you are now probably at a place where you need to create some capabilities. Are you able to do media advocacy? Are you able to do outreach? Are you really capable of uh, managing your partners so that you can mobilize them uh, because there's nothing worse, for example, than holding a press conference that no TV station, no, no newspaper, and nobody else shows up to, uh, and none of your allies show up to. 
uh, because you've done it all wrong, because you didn't have the capability in the first place. You don't want to throw, you don't want to be the one who throws the party nobody shows up at when you're doing advocacy. And so you need to look at creating these advocacy capabilities. So my slide is, I don't know how many folks have seen the movie The Matrix, but that's Keanu Reeves. Uh, they just plugged him in. They just, uh, and they're uploading programs as he's about to fight the, the all-controlling computer. And he wakes up from one of these uploads. Uh, he opens his eyes and he says, I know Kung Fu. Uh, and so that's sort of what you got to do with the organization. You got to upload some things, you got to retool some things, and then open your eyes and say, I know Kung Fu. Now, there's three ways that, um, at least three ways you can create advocacy capabilities. Create new organizational structures within your organizational boundaries. So what we did is we went out and got a grant, and so that's why we have a campaign manager and a structure around that position. We also have a media and communications director and structure around that position. That added to our capabilities when it came to advocacy of all sorts. You can spin out an independent organization from the existing organization and have them develop new processes. It's easier. They start clean and then they work on your behalf. You can also acquire a different organization whose processes and values more closely match what you're trying to do. Now, we're public defenders, generally speaking. Some of us are nonprofits. Some of us are government agencies. So we're not going to generally be able to acquire different organizations. We don't do mergers and acquisitions as a part of the public defender function. Uh, but in some places I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in nonprofits, for example, where our, for example, here in New Orleans, our Louisiana Center for Children's Rights uh, basically merged with the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana so that they could increase their policy advocacy advocacy capability, because as LCCR was more focused on frontline representation of kids, Indi individual kids, one at a time, their cases. So their values were different. And But JJPL had always been in the business of policy advocacy. So their values more, uh, more readily fit what LCCR believed needed to be done, which was more advocacy on the policy end to change what was going on with children, not just in Louisiana, but for the rest of the state. All right, now there's four things we need to remember as leaders, or any organization for that matter, uh, of, of defender organizations or any organization. Um, we need to remember four things. One, what got you here won't get you there. Uh, you got to build, you got to continue to build and learn uh, and deal with your capacity and respond to the different challenges that come with our positions. You got to be able to have the capacity to respond to some, to some crises. Um, right now it's making its way through the webs of uh, a public defender, uh, I think 18 or 19 year veteran who was arrested for resisting arrest. Uh, and it's going viral because Jeff Adachi in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office has very has a very stout uh, media capacity. They're very good at it. You hear I I, I hear about Jeff Adachi way too much. Uh, and I like to joke, but he was able to respond to this in a very coordinated way, very quickly because of the capacity he had built. Manage yourself, figure out who you are, and optimize your performance. You may not be the one who hits the stump and talks to everybody. You might need to look inside your staff and leverage some relationships that already exist, um, or just understand that you don't have the temperament to go into some environment. So manage yourself. One of the things we did for budget advocacy is we made presentations to uh, all of the 
all of the neighborhood associations who would have us. And some of them were not exactly happy about public defense, uh, very worried about crime, that sort of thing. So it got a little bit hostile, uh, but we still, we still did it and we were better for it because they were better able to understand our role as part of a, a functioning criminal justice system. And we managed to, to keep our cool. Don't be afraid to complicate the problem. Um, some problems are hard to solve, uh, but even the easy ones require comprehensive thinking. And by complicate the problem, I, I mean, sometimes you will see a path of least resistance, but there will be collateral things that you still need to take care of. Wrap it all up. It's like, it's like the global plea agreement. Your, your client's facing 20 different charges, but you can wrap it up in five. Um, uh, you want one, but think about some of the other collateral things you may need to take care of so that uh, everything uh, is, is moving smoothly from that point forward. And the thing I always end with, you are not powerless, ever. A lot of public defender offices, particularly here in the Deep South where we practice, have a very uh, fatalistic view of reform, advocacy, all of these challenges, and that there's nothing we can do. There's always something you can do, always something your organization can do. Uh, you are not powerless ever. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Michelle. Derwin, thank you so very much. Uh, that was incredibly, incredibly informative. Um, I do want to say that um, when you talked about your inventory, um, I don't know if I can get back to that, uh, and, and access, you know, assessing your, your resources, that was something that um, I think that people can use as a checklist um, in, in terms of, of trying to um, put their advocacy plans um, to work in terms of what do you want, um, who can give you what you want, who can take you know away what you want and what you bring to the table and, and who is with you. I do have a couple of questions um, for you and here. Um, first, Derwin, for you, you mentioned that you got a grant um, to hire campaign manager and organizer. Um, what was that process like? Because I know a lot of people have a hard time because of the lack of resources, and, and, and how, how, how do you find those resources? Was that a private funder? Was that a, a federal or state funder? What was that process like? It was, a, it was a private foundation who we already had a grant with, and I got the grant breakup call, as, as a lot of us uh, are used to, and that they were pulling out of this area. It was with um, uh, OSF. Um, Open Society uh, Foundation, or Soros. And so we, uh, my team and I put together a couple of pitches to try and get them um, to remain involved because they had been so, so instrumental in us building our capacity up to that point. And so we had some letters of, of inquiry that we put together, and this was the initiative that they funded. And a lot of our funding uh, sort of goes along those lines. As we get together, we don't, we don't necessarily look for funders and try and fit in. What we did was we brainstormed some of the big needs we saw uh, on a macro scale and said, let's, let's see if we can get some capacity added to do some work around this. And so this was a private foundation, but we've been able to do work through our city with uh, federal grants as well, um, and, and it's essentially the same process for us. Um, I will also state to the participants that, you know, the Department of Justice has um, gotten some smart defense money, um, and there should be an RFP coming out for that any day now, um, sometime next month, and so people can look, keep an eye out for that, and they're looking for innovative 
um, projects like the one that you're doing in Louisiana. So um, people, please keep an eye out for that. Now, I do have um, one question for both of you, um, which is um, how do, do you cultivate relationships or who do you cultivate relationships with to learn the processes, the external processes about budgeting? Because um, sometimes we're so internal. So, so who do you look to to educate you about those external processes that you that you need to navigate? Um, Kira, let me start with you. Yeah. Well, as far as budgeting was concerned, it was a numbers game, and it was kind of a luck of the draw. We were we're very local, so our local funders count on pretty much everyone in the county for for voting. Uh, not only that, our DA is elected. So we look for organizations that have some power. Churches were huge. Uh, we definitely got out to all the churches and put our message out there and started working with them because every local politician goes to churches for votes. So we wanted to get the numbers and, and play the numbers game. Um, we did luck up and find some people that had relationships with our funders. And like I said, the more you get out there, the more you start to understand how these relationships work. And that's really kind of what we did. Uh, Duran, how, how did you do that? Well, when we were looking around, when we were brainstorming sort of folks we knew who were stakeholders and decision makers, we, we wanted to find out were there any, any relationships we had with folks who had some experience in budgeting processes, and we do a, a local and state level budgeting process. And so what, we're, what we were able to find and discover is that we did have some allies who were part of the budgeting process at both levels. So we were able to reach out to, at the state level, some legislators who were part of the House Committee on Budget and Senate Finance Committee. And we were able to talk to city council members, in particular, the city council member in my district who I knew, like, tell me about the budget process. How does this work? Along with other sort of sister and like-minded organizations that had gone through the process to give us sort of, the, so between all of that, we were able to get nuts, bolts, and a little bit of the underbelly for each of those processes. And we took that, that information and ran with it. And we were also able to make some relationships with some lobbyists, both uh, at the local level and at the state level who are willing to help us out, who were also philosophically aligned with us and sort of shepherded us through that process. Well, um, we are out of time, but I would like to thank both of the panelists, both Kira and Duran, for those responses to those questions and to their presentation. If you have any other questions, you can contact Preeti Manon, the senior, senior policy associate at the Justice Program Office at American University, and her email is on the screen there, and this is recorded. And so you will be able to go back to the slides and to the presentation and to contact Preeti um, for more information. Also, stay tuned for our other webinar um, sessions that we're having in April on data collection and analysis for budget advocacy and also for persuasive budgeting advocacy. Again, Kier and Derwin, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.